What is love? What is love? What is love? Good morning, Good morning to everyone here at High Hill Christian Church. Today, we're going to continue on Robert's series. Goodness, hope he's okay. We're going to continue on Robert's series, What is Love?, and we're going to start this morning with a, in a, in a, with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with grateful hearts. We pray, Father God, that you will move your spirit among this church. Help all of us to understand what this message is all about. Open our ears, our minds, our hearts to the message, message that you're trying to give to us today. This message is very important, Father. Uh, we need to know that we need to love more and to love better. And so, Heavenly Father, we just pray that your spirit would be here and move us all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> Some weeks back, Robert asked me if I would be willing to preach the second week of a series on what is love. Well, I've heard this love chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 many, many times over the years, so I agree, thinking, just how hard could this be? Well, let me tell you, it was a lot harder than I ever had, had ever thought and imagined. After starting researching commentary sermons and studies, I soon realized that I might be in over my head <clears throat> that... Uh, It was going to be a lot deeper and a lot more difficult than I'd anticipated. I went to Robert to confess that I was not living up to this agape, agape love that I was to preach on. Um, and lo and behold, you couldn't imagine what his response was. He said, since you know you're not in the right place to do this sermon means that you are the right person to do it. So here I am. I'm going to begin this morning with a little simple example of love and emotion that I think a lot of people can relate to. How many people here love dogs? Many. And, and by the way, what does dog spell backwards? I don't think that's a coincidence, is it? It's not to me anyway. Um, Luger's going to come up here. Uh, he's my four-legged buddy that I'm very... <laughs> very happy to be blessed with. Luger. Luger. Whew, up here. Come on. Come on. Come on up. Can you sit? Good boy. How about give me a high five? Good boy. Good boy. Um... This dog is, uh, he is probably my best bud. He goes with me everywhere I go. Um, he comes to elders meeting. You gonna leave me now? <laughs> He's gonna go visit. Um, he comes to elders meetings every Monday and Thursday. Um, uh, he goes with me to work. Um, Goes with me when I'm just out messing around, doing whatever. He's with me every second of every day that uh, he's able to go with me. Um, and as I was preparing this sermon, 
I took a break and went to my back room, sat in the recliner, and was just thinking and praying and, and trying to figure out, Luger, Dave may not like you. You don't know. you got to be true. Come on, Luger. Luger, hey, come on back up here. Come on. Come. Now sit. Now lay down. Lay down. Good boy. Where was I? When I was preparing this sermon, I went back and was sitting in my recliner praying and thinking about what I had been researching. And, and uh, he happened to come back to that room, which wherever I go in the house, he's right there. If I'm in the living room watching TV, he's beside my chair. If I go to bed, he's in, either on my bed or beside my bed. If I go to the bathroom, he's outside the door. If I take a shower, he's outside my door still. So I, I, can't, I can't leave him. And he knows that when I'm getting ready to go outside... I'm leaving, and he's not, I mean, he's, he's, he's attached to me. So as I was sitting there looking, looking at him in, uh, in the back room, it, it just kind of dawned on me. I said, man, Luger, your love is kind of like God's love. You love me so much that no matter what I do, He's there with me. And it reminds me so much of God's love. No matter what we do to God, God always loves us. God is there for us. He is long-suffering in regard to passing judgment on us. Um, there was an example. I didn't, I didn't do this first service, but there was an example of God's long-suffering with Noah. So, Noah told, or God told Noah to build the ark. And so Noah started, he obliged, started building the ark. There were no believers on the face of the earth other than the eight people in, in Noah's family. So God allowed it to go. How long did it take to build the, the ark? It was 120 years. So God was long-suffering for 120 years until the ark was completed and then God passed judgment on the earth. So that's a long time to hold judgment and waiting to pass it. So God is long-suffering. He loves us that much that he continues to let us go without punishment. And, and so that kind of reminds me from him that no matter what I tell him, no matter if I yell at him or I, I don't take him with me or whatever, um, it just shows me how much love that he has for me and how much he wants to be with me. And, and it kind of, that's a kind of a reflection of God's love. So <clears throat> from there, we're going to uh, uh, get back on the subject as to God's love. Let's review a little bit about what Robert stated last week. He introduced 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God, and God in them. We remember the four Greek words for love. The first one is eros, which is a physical love, sensual love. If not careful, eros love could be at the height of selfishness. <clears throat> Storge is the next. Love for family, slash relationships, love for people. Philios, psychological or social love, close friendships. Now agape is different from the previous three. Agape is spiritual or divine love that comes from God. It's a sacrificial love. We have talked a lot about the gifts of the Holy Spirit lately. It's no coincidence that 1 Corinthians 12 and chapter 14 speak of gifts and that 1 Corinthians chapter 13 the love chapter is placed between these two. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3, verse 1 says, If I speak in tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. How many of us would like to sit here with someone banging continuously? Non-stop. What would it, I mean, how would you feel? It would be very annoying, correct? So here Paul is saying that 
All this is like just banging cymbals or a gong, clanging cymbals or a gong. Um, verse 2, if you have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, but if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, then it means absolutely nothing. So, <clears throat> kind of lost my place here. There we go. <clears throat> I may be out of, yeah, it's the problem. I'm out of sequence. Here we go. I'll get it right here in a minute. There we go. Let me start over here. If you have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but do, but do not have love, I am nothing. Verse 3 says, If I give all I possess to the poor <clears throat> and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love I gain absolutely nothing. Here Paul talks about the church of Corinth, who have all these spiritual gifts given to them, but they're not doing it with love. Verse 1 states, I am a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. I am without love. Verse 2, without love, I am nothing. Verse 3 states, without love, I gain nothing. At the end of chapter 13, it states in verse 13, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So, so what is next? I think, personally, that we all need to find a new way to love. Agape love. Agape love is God's central priority through all of the New Testament. How do we know this? Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40, Love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets, meaning prophecy, hang on these two commandments. Now let's take a look at this agape love that God wants us to have by looking at some verses about love. John chapter 3, verse 13, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 15, verse 13, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have, crucified, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I know live in the flesh... I live by faith in the Son of God, who trusts me and gave himself for me. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, And walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Ephesians chapter 5, 25, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, meaning the church. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. 1 John 4, verse 9, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. 1 John 4.10 being the last one. No, it's not a second to the last one. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us 
and sent his own, one and only Son, atoning sacrifice for our sins. Revelation chapter 1, 5. From Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. So, through all these scriptures, what is the one central theme God wants us to see here? Agape, agape love is, a, is synonymous with what? With what? Sacrifice. sacrifice. Yes, sacrifice. An author, Dr. Cecil Osborne, wrote in one of his books about a woman who said to her counselor, I would like to have married a man who was strong, soft, and gentle. He would be strong enough to put me in my place when I got out of line, but would understand and be tolerant of my occasional outbursts and tantrums, and wise enough to see I need a good cry every now and then. He would pat me and console me and not argue with me. She went on in great lengths to describe the paragon of virtues while the husband sat there listening intently to all the traits that she had desired to have in a husband that she had not gotten. He then said with a trace of bitterness, there was once a man like that, but they crucified him between two thieves. The husband was absolutely correct in his statement. 1 Corinthians 13 is referring to that divine sacrificial love. It is not human love. It is a love that seems to be almost unattainable to achieve. Paul writes this letter to the church of Corinth that could have been a lot like High Hill Christian Church or any other church in the world. The Corinthian church was blessed with many, many kinds of spiritual gifts. But Paul gave the evidence that they lacked the sacrificial love in the use of these gifts. And without sacrificial love, it makes action and gifts useless. Here Paul is showing what the church was not and what the church should be. And in the same situation, Paul could be talking to High Hill Christian Church and what it is not and what High Hill Church should be. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 through 3 shows the preeminence or the superiority of the love in verses 4 and 7 and in superiority of love and verses 4 and 7 shows the performance of love we need as God's people to have his type of sacrificial love in the church today. Using our gifts in love is what we are called to do. Paul, notice Paul doesn't mention any gifts in the rest of chapter 13 if you would read it. Love without gifts retains its value undiminished. Gifts without love, on the other hand, are completely worthless. The Bible tells us that God is love. Christ is God. If God is love and Christ is God, then Christ is love. God is the definition of love. If you read all of 1 Corinthians 13, it's not just describing love, but God's complete nature. Now, we're going to move from the preeminence of love to the performance of love. Love is patient. Patience is translated to long-suffering or suffering long. Patience is slow to anger. Being patient is a person who is taken advantage of by another over and over again and never getting angry because of it. With long-suffering love, you possess a long waiting time, a passive quality that implies victory over resentment. Agape love, a type of love that is impossible to, to attain without the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is the example of the love that is long-suffering. I've heard many people in the church, including our church, 
say we should never pray for patience. Well, guess what? Without that patience, we cannot attain agape love. We're going to talk about kindness in a bit. So I am, going, I am going to show my kindness this morning by not exposing those who have said we should not pray for pay, 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 bleh, that we should not pray for pay, patience. Culture has over time pushed society's morals and values away from biblical beliefs. This culture has convinced many that if we want something in life, let no one get in your way to keep you from your wants and dreams. This culture has taught that you don't have to like anyone in this culture of dislikes and selfishness and getting even. It has walked right through the doors of our churches. Satan is behind this and pushing our culture away from biblical values. And we are allowing him to do so. God commands us to love all people. We have to love people who are hard to like, hard to love. We have to love people who are irritating. We have to love stubborn people. People on the unattractive side, people with disabilities. We have to love the poor, the lazy, the prisoners, the unbelievers, and the list goes on and on all the way to loving our enemies. The church, the church does a terrible job at loving with agape love. Patience, a long-suffering attitude toward irritating people that we all face in our relationship with others. Long-suffering or suffering long. We have a God that is long-suffering, and thank goodness for that. We have a God, or we have a long-suffering God who refrains his judgment on our sinful culture and long-suffering judgment on our church. Our God is patient and long-suffering with each of us and slow to anger. God's kind of love is directed outward toward others, not inward toward ourselves. It is totally unselfish. This kind of love goes totally against our carnal nature. It is, however, possible to receive and practice this agape love through God's gift of the Holy Spirit. And only through His Holy Spirit who helps us put aside our own selfish desires and instincts so we can give love while expecting nothing, absolutely nothing in return. So the more, we've come, the more we come be like, the more we become like Jesus, the more we will be able to agape love others. We will now move on to the second half of verse 4, love is kind. There are so many areas of our lives where kindness is absent. If patience or long-suffering is a passive quality, then kindness is an active quality. Kindness is generous. Kindness is, is, a, is powerful, moves us to support and heal someone that can offer nothing in return. Kindness is that power that can move self-centered egos to the weak, the ugly, the hurt, and move that ego to invest itself in personal care with no expectations of reward. If patience is victory over resentment, then kindness is victory over selfishness. It is one thing to be long-suffering or patient when one has done something that deserves retaliation and you do not respond, but it is totally another thing when you offer up the opposite reaction kindness in return. Let's move to the last verse that we're going to look at this morning. We're going to skip verse 5 and 6 of Corinthians 13 and move to verse 7. Robert will touch on 5 and 6 next week. I read this in a sermon and thought it explained verse 7 very well. 
Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes in all things, endures all things. 1 Corinthians 13, 7. Agape love always protects or bears all things. The word translated bear actually means covers. So that would be a better translation than bears. Paul expands on this idea in 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Agape love never proclaims the errors of good men. It is by no means honorable to men and women to be common informers. That's called gossip. Agape love, oh, agape love always trusts or believes in, in all things. We should never believe a lie. We never believe evil unless the facts totally demand it. We choose to believe the best of others. Agape love always hopes. It hopes in all things. Love has confidence in the future, not pessimism. When hurt, it does not say, it will be this way forever and even get worse. It hopes for the best, and it hopes in God. Agape love always preserves, perseveres, excuse me. Love always perseveres. It endures all things. Most of us can bear all things, but believe all things and hope in all things, but only for a while. The greatness of agape love is it keeps on bearing, believing, and hoping. It does not give up. It destroys enemies by turning them into friends. Charles Spurgeon said, If your, breth if your brethren are angry without cause, be sorry for them. But do not let them conquer you by driving you into a bad temper. Stand fast in love. Endure not some things, but all things, for Christ's sake, so you can prove yourself to be a Christian indeed. As we move into our time of response, I want to ask you a few questions. First, are you born again? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus Christ and accepted His gift of forgiveness? Without being born again, we cannot love people like God loves us, like God calls us to love with agape love. If you would like to talk with someone about that and what that means to surrender your life to Christ, then in a moment when they start singing, come talk with me. If Jesus is already Lord of your life, then the question is, are you loving like this, this agape love? Are you a patient person? Are you a kind person? When someone hurts or offends you, do you cover that offense with love? Do you believe the best in others? Do you have hope in the future? Are you optimistic? Are you willing to give up? I know as I was preparing for this message, I saw many ways in my own life that I do not demonstrate agape love. I need to do better. We all here need to do better. So, as we move into the time of response, if you are not demonstrating agape love toward yourself or others, I want to offer you the opportunity to come to the altar and ask the Holy Spirit to renew your mind and transform your heart so that you can walk in agape love. How many of you have conquered this type of love? I know I have not. Each and every one of us should at some point ask for the Holy Spirit to teach us how to agape love.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we sit here in your presence today, we pray that our hearts and our minds will be opened to the Holy Spirit, that that Holy Spirit can convict us. Convict us to understand what we are commanded to do by the Almighty God. We need to go against our carnal knowledge, our, the flesh. And if we're going to become a loving church, we have to learn how to agape love. We're going to have to break those things that keep us away from that. We're going to have to change the way we look at everybody else. Because Satan's going to beat us down. He's going to tell us these people are worthless. You don't need to like those people. Those people are not like you. You have no need to reach out to the poor, to the hurting, the homeless, to our enemies. So, Father God, speak to our hearts and our minds today as we sit here. We praise you and thank you for being a long-suffering, patient God because we most definitely deserve punishment. So God, thank you for loving us so much. And we pray this all in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.